Today we're going to talk about springs in the terms of Newtonian mechanics. And so from Newtonian mechanics, we have that the force of a spring is negative kx, maybe we'll call this delta x. And this is called Hooke's law, which is an empirical formula, meaning derived from experiments um, by a person named Hooke. And so let's draw what this looks like. So if we have some spring attached to some mass, and this call it x1. This stretch of the spring is, or maybe x eq for equilibrium. So the equilibrium position says where the spring is not stretched or compressed. So if we have the spring getting squished like this, or if we have the spring stretched out really far, x2 or x1, then we can define delta x from the Hooke's Law equation as the distance between the current position and the equilibrium position. And so just looking at these positions, we would have, so let's just assign a number to this. Let's say the equilibrium position is at one centimeter and that's two centimeters, maybe two, three, and one. So delta x would be three minus two, which would be one. And the, the, from the squished spring, we would get one minus two, which is negative one. So if we plug those delta x's into here, so the force at position two, we would get negative k times one. And so our force is pointing in the negative direction. So it's pointing back towards the equilibrium position. So that's what you expect a spring to do. It wants to go back to the equilibrium position. And so this negative sign uh, is what accounts for that wanting to return to the equilibrium position. And then if you did the same for F1. So you have negative K times Delta X, which was negative one. So you get a plus direction on your force. So F1 is trying to push the, the mass back towards the equilibrium position. Okay. So then uh, the other thing that's the other variable left in this equation is K, which is the spring constant. 
and this variable uh, describes how hard it is to stretch the spring. So if K is very large, then it's very hard to pull the string apart, the spring apart. And if it's small, then it's very easy to stretch your spring. So how hard is to stretch the spring? Okay, so that's the way the force for Hooke's law works. But now what about the energy for a spring? So just like we had uh, for gravity, we were able to go from Newtonian gravity to uh, force of gravity for a, an orbiting body. Uh, we can do the same for springs. So potential energy is integral F dx. The spring force is kx. I'm just going to ignore the minus sign for now. dx. And so you get negative, or not negative, one half kx squared for your spring potential. And so just like with any other uh, energy, you can use this in a conservation of energy equation. So let's say you stretched a spring or compressed a spring and you let it go and you wanted to see how fast the mass would be moving at the equilibrium position. You would just set up your conservation of energy, start with spring potential, end with kinetic energy. Oops. And then you get one half kx squared equals one half mv squared. Solving that for v, you would get square root of k over m times x. And this would be the speed at equilibrium. Or you could start by saying you throw the mass on the spring by some initial velocity and you want to figure out how far that stretches using conservation of energy. So you can do that. So the reason I've held off on talking about springs uh, is, well, a couple of reasons. So the first is that for springs, your acceleration A is not constant. So when we were doing kinematics and we had the force of gravity very close to the Earth, we could approximate that acceleration to be constant, just 9.8 meters per second squared. So we can't do that for a spring because the force goes as the displacement x or delta x from the equilibrium position. So as soon as I compress my spring, so if I go from equilibrium to not equilibrium, now, if I release this from rest or from the stretched position, now as I move closer to equilibrium, my acceleration is changing too because my delta x is changing. So it's a more complicated process than just assuming a constant acceleration and um, using the kinematic equations. And what we'll do um, in a week 
is see how to solve for the equations of motion using Lagrangians. But for now, something I want to touch on is that, uh, so we introduced circular motion and this spring, mass on a spring system uh, is analogous to circular motion. And so what I mean by that is that just like if you were going in a circle and you start here, you'll go around and eventually you'll end up at the same place that you started. So a spring will also do that, right? If you stretched it from to this point initial, then it would compress and then it would overshoot the equilibrium position to get to this, call it point A maybe. And then after point A, now it has a bunch of spring potential built up and it'll shoot back out, overshooting the equilibrium position and end up back where it started. So some of the things that we did with circular motion, we can apply to um, the spring system. And so things that undergo motion like this are called simple harmonic oscillators. And this is a very powerful tool because we approximate a lot of things in physics as simple harmonic oscillators. Uh, so the a famous example that you see in quantum mechanics is the hydrogen atom. Uh, we can approximate the motion of the electron orbiting the nucleus of the hydrogen atom as uh, simple harmonic motion and then you build perturbations on top of that uh, to account for the, the quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical nature of the system. But it all starts with the base of a simple harmonic oscillator. And so these techniques apply for not just Newtonian or classical mechanics, but you can apply it to electrodynamics, quantum mechanics. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, so, just as a preview of that, and before we get into Lagrangians and Hamiltonians, uh, I wanna show you an example of how to derive some of those things using Newtonian physics before we then derive them using Lagrangians and Hamiltonians, and then we can compare and contrast uh, which way is easier and do we indeed get the same results. Okay, so the first thing I want to show is how we get the period of a harmonic oscillator. And this is just from Newtonian mechanics. Okay, so we'll start so if this is our spring and mass system, mass M, spring constant K, we know the force on this is Kx. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna worry about the negative sign for right now. It's not, uh, not super important. It's just telling us what direction the force is going. So we also know that force equals MA. So if we solve this for acceleration, we get K over M X. Now, okay, so maybe we'll just put this in a box and call this equation one. 
Now, as a brief aside from harmonic or from circular motion, we know that we have from circular motion, if we had some centripetal force pulling something in, and there was some tangential velocity Vt, we would have this equation, Vt squared over R. Now, instead of having a circle, we have a spring that moves this way when it compresses, and then the opposite way when it's expanding. And so, so this is for circular motion. Circular motion. And for spring motion, we can write d squared over x. And then also from circular motion, we could relate our linear velocity with our rotational velocity. So V squared equals omega squared, or not with a square, oops. V equals omega R. So V squared equals omega squared R squared. And those, so the analog for spring motion is that V squared equals omega squared X squared. Because this thing is only moving in one dimension X, so there's no radius to, to take into account. So if we would plug this omega squared, or this V squared equals omega squared X squared into this equation, get omega squared X squared over X, which equals omega squared X. So the acceleration here is omega squared x. So that's our second equation. So equation one was a equals k over m x. Equation two, a equals omega squared x. So set one equal to two. So A equals A, K over M X equals omega squared X, cancel out the X's and you get omega squared equals K over M. So omega equals square root K over M. So the angular velocity of a spring system is the square root of the ratio of the spring constant over the mass. And the way to think about angular velocity when something's not going around in a circle is to relate it to uh, its period or its frequency. So just from circular motion, We know that the period of something that's doing a repetitive motion like a spring is two pi over omega. And this just comes from the fact that um, if you're doing one complete, uh, so going from, oops, going from stretched to scrunched, back to stretched. If you use the analog of going in a circle, one uh, rotation around the circle is two pi radians. So one complete uh, period of going from stretched to compress back to stretch uh, would be 
two pi. So that's where this two pi is coming from. And so if you plug in our equation for omega, you get uh, the period for a spring mass system is square root of m over k. So that's the derivation for a, the period of a simple harmonic oscillator. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.